ago, I pastored in another city, and Sunday service was over, and my people were driving home. And one of the couples would report it to me that afternoon. As they rounded a bend in the road, they came upon a scene where fire engines were there with their lights flashing and a great crowd of people had gathered in the road and around a two-story house that was on fire. Everybody was anxious because the one thing that was captivating everybody's attention was a man and woman who had been in the house when the house caught fire. They were on the second floor in the bedroom. They were trapped because the flames had cut them off from the downstairs. They had tied a bed sheet to the bedpost, threw it out the window, and there they were, totally naked, hanging onto that bed sheet, unable to get down to the ground. And all the neighbors and all the firemen and all the passers-by were there gawking at them. And the woman's husband was in the crowd as he was looking at her, hanging there with some other man. Now, I promise you from that day until she died, if she's still living or when she dies, Every time that woman smells smoke, she'll remember that day she hung out there on the side of that house. And every time a fire engine sounds, that man will remember the day he got caught with somebody else's wife. It's an experience they'll never forget. Now, I want to introduce you to a person today who is one of the most unforgettable people in all the Word of God, and yet most people don't know their name. She is one of those that God chose and chose her for a particular task and God had a plan that is going to affect the rest of history because of this woman with a red rope in her hand. In your Bible, the book of Joshua, chapter 2, I'm going to read the scripture and then we're going to examine it in some depth. Joshua. You'll find that right after the book of Deuteronomy if you don't know the place. Deut uh, Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun. By the way, he didn't have a mother and daddy. Did you see that? He was the son of Nun. No, that's not true. That's not N-O-N-E, but that's N-U-N. And that wasn't a Catholic sister either, but uh, this is Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shintam two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab. Mark that, please. Harlot's house, Rahab. And lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wished or do not know whence they were, and it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate when it was dark that the men went out. Whither the men went, I want not. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them to the way, uh, pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords, and as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them on the, upon the roof, and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. 
For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. What you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Jericho, the city in question in this scripture, is situated alongside of the Jordan River, just north of the Dead Sea. It's a city of great significance in the ancient world. It's reputed to be, and there's a sign there today, that this is the oldest city in the world. Its location puts it on a path of several important trade routes so that Tradesmen coming from uh, the northern part of the world or the southern part of the world or the eastern part of the world all would converge and come right through this very important city called Jericho. It was there that Joshua had led the people across the river Jordan and is now encamped just south of that in a place called Gilgal. And from there he is going to launch a campaign whereby he is going to take the entire country of Palestine. He is going to take the land of promise that God had promised unto Abraham, but which was occupied by many other uh, peoples at that particular time. And so he comes to the city of Jericho. Now, he is a, a uh, wise general. He sends out some spies to see what the city is like to see how many soldiers they have, how well fortified it is, where there might be a weakness in the wall, or there where they might have a strategy of being able to take this city. Now at this time, Joshua did not have the word from God that he was going to cause the walls to fall. Joshua is doing what anybody who is wise in the ways of war would do. He's planning on how he's going to take the city. And so the spies come into the city and they come to an harlot's house. Not only is this a, a place where an harlot resides, but this is an inn, no doubt. And uh, so she is operating a, uh, a hotel and uh, these men come there thinking that they're going to be safe. And it's in this, in this house that they meet a strange woman and uh, this woman is, by the way, she is a strange woman to be seeking after God. When I think of people who are seeking God, I don't usually imagine people who are of her reputation lining up and saying, I want to know God. But not only is it strange that she would be seeking for God, but it's strange to me that God would have chosen her, a strange person, to do a task that is absolutely beyond our wildest imagination and will through her bring a great miracle to the world and to the nation of Israel. And I wanted to say to you that the walls of Jericho are falling are nothing compared with what will happen through this woman and through her situation. Now if God could use her, do you reckon God can use you? If God could take a woman of a wasted reputation and turn her around and use her life, I've got a feeling that God won't have any problem taking you, molding you according to his directive will, and thrusting you forth into a place of service that will honor and glorify his name and that your life, just like hers, not only will be a miracle, but it will be a blessing to all who will be affected by you in the years yet to come. But now let's look at this woman and see if we can discover some things about her and her faith. I hope you notice that this woman had great faith in God. Now note with me that faith proclaims. Look at verse 10 and 11. 
For we have heard. Now here's this woman giving a testimony. And she says that her faith is based upon the Word of God. If you read these two verses carefully, you'll see that she says, when we heard what God had done, when we heard how He parted the waters of the Red Sea, when we heard what had happened down at Sihon and the country where Og, the giant, was a ruler, when we heard our hearts melted within us. In other words, all of our courage went away and we knew that there is but one God. She says he is the God in heaven and upon earth. Now, this is a woman who no doubt is also a woman of faith, but her faith is in the pagan gods. She no doubt is one who has pledged herself as a servant of pagan gods and has pledged herself as a prostitute to those uh, pagan gods. Her former faith is a world of the pagans, but it's out of that world that God is going to call forth a woman who is going to be transformed in the presence of the people as they see what God can do with anybody who will submit their life to Him. By the way, we as the church world today are reaching very few from the pagan pool. Now the pagan pool is all around us. You don't have to go searching for it. They are out there everywhere. They live next door to you. They live down the street from you. They go to school with you. They work beside you. And they don't have time for God. Or they question that there is a God. Or they, they are looking to other gods, not to Jehovah God. And we're reaching very few of them. And according to the one of the uh, most eminent authors in our world today, Dr. Rayner says that the churches that are reaching people out of the pagan pool are those who are preaching doctrine based upon the Word of God. Not those who are telling people that they're all right and they're going to be okay and it's just important that you feel good about yourself and that you go out uh, rejoicing but it's those who are preaching, thus saith the word of God, that are reaching the, the lost, reaching those people in the pagan pool. I'm glad this church is listed in that number. And by the way, this church, you may not know it, is in the top 10% of the churches in the United States that are reaching people for Christ and doing a work for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an aside. Let's come back to the text. This woman said, I have not been one who believed, but my soul has awakened unto faith. For one to change her goddess, in spite of all the centuries of tradition that she had on her, on her, half, her behalf, her acceptance by the people, and then to be in Jericho as a solitary believer. She's the only person in the whole city that believes in God. Such a change was not wrought easily or lightly and was not wrought out, one fancies, while she is still pursuing a course of wrong. But this is a soul awakening that takes place in this woman's life. Do you remember in your own walk with God when God began to speak to you, where you were, what you were doing? Someone said recently in a testimony, I was minding my own business when God sent somebody into my pathway and began to describe how God used circumstances and the words of a witness to turn them around and bring them to faith in the Lord God. If God has reached down and touched you, put a hunger in your heart, stirred your soul, made you aware of your sin, and you've cried out, God be merciful unto me, a sinner, you ought to give, lift up your hand and lift up your voice and say, thank you, God, for saving my soul. For this woman is that kind of a person. She is a woman from the pagan world, but God begins to finger around her heart. God begins to tender her mind. God begins to woo her and draw her for the special task that He has chosen and prepared her for. And her life is a saving faith. You see, this is not, it's not enough just to say, I've been born again but your life must display it. Now this woman says, I believe, but now she's putting feet to her prayers. She's putting 
uh, herself into a place of action because faith accesses the Word of God. Look at verse 12. She says, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, give me a promise, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. You see, folks, it's not enough just to say, I'm on my way to glory but you ought to want everybody in your family to go to glory with you. And the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house, and thy house. In other words, friends, all of us who are the children of God ought to be seeking to bring our whole family, our whole family into faith in God. And so in this scripture, here's a woman who says, I have faith. I want you to give me a promise that you're going to save me, but not only me. I'm claiming my father, my mother, my brothers, and my sisters, and all that they have, all their children, I'm claiming them to the glory of God and for the salvation of their souls. Faith accesses the promises of the Word of God. And what is the promise? The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, what? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Again in Acts eleven fourteen, 14 he says, Who shall teach thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? Peter, you remember, had been called to the house of Cornelius. And the angel had said to Cornelius that when he's come, he's going to teach you words whereby you may be saved. Now it's not enough to pray. It's not enough to pray. There must be the preaching of the word, the telling of the word, and the word planted in a heart, will bring forth faith. The word of faith. But there's also the work of faith. 2 Peter 1, 4 says, Whereby are given exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But not only the word of faith and the work of faith, but there is the way of faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, and not by sight. The word of faith does the work of faith in the heart, and the new life of the creature becomes the way of faith. Now, this life-saving faith is a red rope. Now, if you read on, you'll find that these men say, we're going to save you, and you put a red rope out of your window. This will be the token. This will be the promise is the red rope. Now, folks, I want you to know the word red there uh, refers, I'm sure, to a symbol of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Back yonder in Egypt, God told the people, put the blood on your doorpost and on the lintel of your house. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, he says to this woman, when destruction comes, you put a symbol of the blood out of your window. And when I pass through, although everybody else is going to be destroyed, I'm going to save you. And folks, I ask you, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing flood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? There must be the symbol. There must be the blood upon the doorpost of your heart that would declare unto God, I am one who is standing in covenant relationship. I am standing under the blood of Christ and I am covered by His blood and secure because I've been saved through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this woman in her faithfulness not only hid the spies, but now does that simple little thing of hanging a red rope out of her window that will say to those who then come in that I am one of you. I am saved by this blood, by the red rope. But not only does faith Proclaim, but faith persists. Back up with me in our scripture and note with me that no sooner does she declare her faith to these men that her faith is tested. I want you to know, friend, that when you're born again, you're going to be tested. James chapter 1 says, But count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into divers temptations. When temptations or trials or testings come, 
Rejoice in the Lord that God has seen you worthy uh, to be counted a part of His kingdom. And though the testing comes, whatever that form that testing may take makes no difference. Just rejoice that God is working in you to cause your faith to grow and your faith to be strengthened. It's not to destroy you, but it's to strengthen you that the testings of life come your way. If I were to ask you, can you remember a test that came to your life after you were uh, converted, after you confessed Jesus and was saved, can you remember a test that came into your pathway? Maybe somebody put a temptation in front of you that uh, would take you back to your old style of life and to the things of your former world. But you were able to say in the power of the Holy Spirit, no, I'm a Christian now. I don't do that anymore. What happened? The test just made your life that much stronger. When I worked for the Home Light Corporation years ago, when I was a student in college, I was in charge of the, uh, what we call the heat treat department where we took the steel and we uh, subjected it to uh, heat in uh, chemicals and those chemicals would turn, change that metal into a fiery red. You could almost see through the guide bars for the chainsaws because they were so, so red. We took them from room temperature, raised that temperature of the steel up to 1400 degrees in uh, various chemicals and then we dropped them into a vat and, and brought it from 1,400 down to 400 degrees. And then we allowed that to go into another bath of water. And then it cooled at room temperature until you could handle it again. And then we put it into a press and uh, put heavy steel on it. And we would put bolts and tighten it down and put it into an oven and heat that steel up to 1400 degrees and then drag it out of the oven and tighten the bolts down again until we were able to bring it back into a, a rigid and yet straight method. Put it back into that oven and let it cook for hours until it's all back like it ought to be. But now that steel which had been weak before is strong to a point that it'll take all the pressure that some woodsman will be able to put on that saw as the chain grinds over it time after time after time. So it is in our life when we're saved. We're just babes in the Lord. And yet testings begin to come our way. Maybe some of you on your love turns against you and you say, Lord, what am I going to do? And God comes to you and you find that in the heat of your trial that God is sufficient. And after the situation is over, you say, I'm stronger now than I was before. Or maybe you lost your job and you didn't know whether you was going to be able to pay the bills and you cried out, God, why is this happening and what am I going to do? And God in His wonderful way made provision for you. And now when it's over, you look back and say, God was all I needed and I'm stronger now than I was before. Or maybe you were trying to witness to somebody and they turned on you and they talked about you and you felt like that you were just a worthless, no good and you'd never amount to anything. But then one day they got saved and they came back and hugged your neck and thanked you and you said, thank God, I'm stronger than I was before. For faith that is proclaimed must now persist and as it's tried with each struggle, with each trial, you get stronger and stronger in your faith and stronger in your fortitude for God that you can stand and stand up for Him. She was tested, noticed first of all, by the government. The king sent to her. And I want you to know, folks, that in our world today, it's getting more difficult it's not going to get easier in our world. And whether it's the tax man or whether it's the tea man that shows up at your house, I want you to know that it's going to be hard and you'll be tested by all sorts of entities in your world. Not only was she tested by the king, but she's tested by the army. And it's the army or the police at best that show up at her door. And they said, we know you've got some spies in your house. Tell us where they are. And of course she said, I, they went out. I don't know where they went. She told one of those little lies that sidetracked them for she had taken those men knowing that their lives were in jeopardy, knowing that they're men of God, that they're sent there on a purpose and that she is 
trusting God through them to save her alive, and she takes them up on top of her house. She must also be somebody who makes rope for the flax there is uh, designed, no doubt, to, to make rope out of, and she's got it drying up there on top of her house, and she hides them underneath that and tells them to be still, to be quiet until the danger is over. And so in the time of testing, this woman says, I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to, my faith is in God. I'm going to take care of the men of God, and I'm going to watch God at work. What about faith? The Bible says faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. And in that same book of Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. See, two brothers had the same message, but one disbelieved. But the other said, by faith I'm trusting God, and I'm going to carry out His word. It also says, by faith Enoch was translated. Here's a man who just loved God and walked with God all the days of his life, lived so pure in his faith that finally God said, I'm not even going to let you die. I'm just going to take you out of this world and bring you on home to be with me. By faith, Noah built an ark. Now I want you to know that that's quite an amazing task. First of all, he lived in a place where they didn't have boats, big boats. Secondly, he built a boat that's bigger than anything that's ever been built before in that time. Thirdly, he builds a boat in a place where they don't have floods because it had never rained. And, and God says it's going to rain. What's rain, God? I'll tell you later, Noah. Build an ark. Build a ship for the saving of yourselves, yourself and your family. And then he calls the creatures, you remember, to come. And Noah brought them all into the ark. How long? Noah started building an ark. He built on it one year, five years, ten years, fifty years, a hundred years, perhaps as much as a hundred and twenty years, and it hadn't rained. A hundred and twenty years getting ready. Man, I tell you, I'd have worn out by then, wouldn't you? I'd have given up by then. I'd have called in somebody else to do it or I'd have just quit and said it's never going to rain. There's no use for me doing this. But Noah held on because faith persists. Not long ago as I preached on the coming of the Lord, I was questioned about Him. The Bible, by the way, says that in the last days scoffers shall arise saying, where is the promise of His coming? For we have heard this all of our life, and He still hadn't come. I want you to know, I've been preaching for over 40 years that Jesus is coming back again. He hadn't come, but I'm still looking for Him today. I'm praying that He's going to come today, and I believe that He's going to come in an unexpected moment. And when some of those who are scoffing are wondering about His coming, I'm going to leave and they're going to be left behind because the Lord is coming. He has to because He said in His Word that He was. And so we stand on the promise by faith Noah. His faith persisted. And faith that, that uh, remains is faith that's true for faith that falters had a flaw from the first. And we who are in Christ, our faith, stands firm on what God has said in His Word. I need more time to develop that thought, but you'll just have to take it now and build on it yourself and know that whatever God has said, that God never fails. But look with me at her, at faith's prophet. And uh, faith always has an exceeding great reward. Notice that this woman opened her heart before she opened the door of her house. She opened her heart to God, and then she opened her house to God. By the way, I don't know when this woman stopped being a prostitute, but it was before the spies ever got to her house because this woman has given her heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you give your heart to Jesus, you know what he does? He cleans up your life. Now listen to me. Some of you here today, 
Maybe you feel like that you're nothing, that you're wasted and there's no hope for you. I want you to know you're not too far for God to find where you are and you're not too low down that His arm won't reach down to where you are and the moment you call on His holy name, He will lift you up and make you brand new. You say, well, preacher, I'm just as good as the folks down at the church. That's all right. If you're morally pure, you still need God in your life. But when God comes, God will change your life. He'll change you from within and he'll make it known without. And so this woman is a woman who had opened her heart and now she begins to know the, the reward of a purified life. But also, as an honored guest of Israel, this woman is going to become the wife of the head of the tribe of Judah by the name of Salmon. If you read on, you'll see that in the story. Now, I think that Salmon may have been, probably was, in my opinion, one of the spies. And this man came in. He fell in love with this woman just that quick. And he says, we're going to take care of you. You hang a red rope out of your window. And when, the, when we come in, when we destroy the land, when we take over this city, I want you to know that we're going to mark the house where the red rope is hanging. And I know they did because he brought her out. He brought her to the camp of Israel. And now Salomon marries her. Salomon is probably the head of the tribe of Judah. And he marries her. Now listen, her, they, they had a child. And the name of their child was Boaz, who was one of the brightest and most honorable of Israel's saints. Their daughter-in-law is Ruth, the Moabitess. And her grandchild's grandchild's name is David. And out of the house and lineage of David comes Jesus Christ. Isn't it beautiful what God does when he can take someone like her and say, I'm going to change you? Because I've got something in mind hundreds of years down the road that you don't understand now. And you'll already be with me then, but you'll see what I'm doing. God working in you has a plan that is more marvelous than you can even begin to imagine. What God does in your life now and does through your living may not only bless your life, as it did with her. But it's going to bless others in years to come. And I pray that you're building a lineage that is going to leave faith in the hearts of everybody you touch so that when the books are written and we stand before him, he'll be able to pull all of those things forth and remind us. I believe that when some of us stand before God, we're going to say, Lord, I didn't do anything for you. All I did was I just went to church and I was faithful in my giving and I did pray and I tried to do the best I could in my life. And God's going to turn and say, turn around and look. And down yonder is going to be a long line of folks and they're going, he's maybe going to say, because you gave to the church, that church won people. And out of that number came a preacher and that preacher won. And see, all of that reward just keeps building up and building up and building up so that when you stand before God, the glory of your life will be that many have followed after you because of your faith and your faithfulness. This woman hid the spies. This woman said, there's only one God, and he's the God of Israel. He is Jehovah God. This woman said, give me a promise. And they said, we're going to give you a red rope. You put it out your window, and that's going to signify that you will be saved. Hers was not a rope to escape, to climb down the wall, but hers is a rope of security as she awaits the fulfillment of her faith. You see, faith that rests in the Word is faith that is always tried. 
And faith that is tried and stands is faith that is stronger. And faith that is strong is faith that is rewarded. Back yonder when I surrendered to preach, I surrendered on Sunday night and on Monday I gave my notice to the company that I was leaving their employment, gave them two weeks' notice so that we could clean up the books and everything would be fine. And they didn't want me to leave. And without my knowledge and behind my back, two of the officials of that company went to my home and talked to my wife. And they said to her, you know, everything's going good and, and he's got such promise and, and he's doing so well and if, if he leaves, he's going to lose all that and you won't have the income, you won't have, and they painted a picture and wanted my wife then to try and convince me that I should not leave their employment and I should not become a preacher. To which my wife said, he says God's called him to preach. And as his wife, wherever he goes, I'm going with him. And I will not do anything to undermine what God's calling him to do. And the president of that company said to her, he'll never make it. And she said, make it or not, we're going on with God. I didn't know that for a long time. She didn't tell me that for a long time. I loved her before. I loved her more after that. But I thank God. I thank God that faith is always rewarded. And when we walk with God, whatever the cost may be, God always rewards us. Now, I believe that woman, if I know anything at all about life, that some of her family are afraid. And I'm sure somebody said, what have you done? Why, you've hid these spies and you lied to the king. Why, they're going to arrest us all. And I can see her as she holds up that rope in her hand and she says, oh, no. I've got a red rope. And my red rope says that God's going to take care of me. And I'm sure that her daddy or her mother might have said, now how are they going to know why, why when they come in and they start killing folks, they're just going to kill anybody that gets in the way. And she says, oh no, oh no, I've got a red rope. And they said that when they see the rope, but how can you believe them? Because they're people of God. And God brought them out of Egypt and God parted the waters and God destroyed the kings before them. And the same God that was with them then is going to be with us now. I've got a red rope. As long as I'm standing with God, everything's going to be all right. Is there a red rope in your hand? Is there a red rope of faith hanging out the window of your life. Are you able to say, God promised, and I'm standing on the promises of God. Some of you came today, and in your world right now, you're struggling with situations that you don't know how to handle. May I ask you to just place yourself at the availability of God and just confess, Lord, this is bigger than I am. I can't handle it. But I'm trusting you for you promise that you will fight my battles and you will bring my victory. And God, I just need you to come through. And if you don't come through, I don't know what I'm going to do. Hey, when you're at his disposal, he always comes through on time. He always does what's good. Like the little boy finishing his prayers said, God, bless mama, bless, bless daddy, bless granddaddy, grandmama, and oh yeah, God, take care of yourself.
Because if anything happens to you, we're all sunk. But there's nothing going to happen to him, for he is God. And I've got a red rope of faith that says he will see me through. Amen? Let's bow our heads. With our heads bowed, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that all of us hearing the word from the word of God and letting the Holy Spirit apply it to our...